afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve David. I'm a member of your Indiana Supreme Court, and I have the honor and privilege of, of chairing the Jail Overcrowding Task Force meeting today, November 6, 2019. I apologize for the late start. Um, it's entirely my fault, and, uh, and, and we appreciate your timeliness, and uh, we had a, some business we need to transact. We got a little bit of a delay, but uh, we'll, we'll make up for that. Um, I'd like to thank Anderson University. Who here attends Anderson University? Do we have any students, faculty, administrative representatives? I know the president, um, John Pistol, was not able to be here, but we're very grateful for Anderson's hosting of this event. And uh, not just a thank you to the university and to the president, but also to Lisa Ragsdale, the director of conference and performance events. This is a very good facility for us to have our public meeting, our, our last public meeting of the Jail Overcrowding Task Force. I want to uh, introduce members of the task force and, and ask them to uh, wave or stand or otherwise uh, assist you and those of you that are viewing this um, via the internet to identify a name with a face. Uh, our co-vice chair is Representative Greg Sturwald, House District 40. Representative Sturwald, good morning, sir. Uh, Representative Reagan Hatcher is House District 3. She's unable to be with us today, um, but she will be participating and has been participating in this. Uh, Senator Mike Gaskell, co-vice chair, uh, um, Indiana Senate District 26. Senator J.D. Ford, Senate District 29. Uh, Tracy Brown is Tippecanoe, Tippecanoe County Commissioner who's unable to be with us, but I think has joined us via the internet. Uh, Douglas Hutzinger, Office of the Governor, Mr. Hutzinger, is present. Ralph Watson, Indiana Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Indiana DOC Department of Correction uh, Commissioner uh, Robert Carter, Mr. Carter. Representing the Indiana Prosecuting Attorney's Council, Mr. David Powell. Bernice Curley from the Indiana Public Defender Council is unable to be here. I believe Mr. Mark uh, Carnell is here on her behalf today. Uh, Sheriff Brett Clark, Hendricks County Sheriff, and Superintendent Doug Carter of the Indiana State Police. So welcome uh, task force uh, members. Those of you that are attending perhaps your first meeting of the task force and those of you that are tuning in via the internet, again, the purpose of the task force is to, it's very simple but extremely complex, and that is to conduct a statewide review of jail overcrowding to identify common reasons for that situation, although it's uh, different and varies from county to county, but are there common problems and can we identify some possible common solutions to that, as well as studies way, study ways to re reduce recidivism for those in jail uh, with the possibility of offering uh, jail programs and services. We wanna thank all of you for attending today We'll be receiving some presentations. You'll have an opportunity to view those and hear some issues related to jail overcrowding as well as taking public testimony. The task force information can be found online at the web address that you have on the screen in front of you uh, and included in the information sheet that I believe was passed out to all of you before you entered this auditorium. Before we begin uh, taking testimony and hearing presentations today, We'd at, we have asked uh, Senator Mike Gaskell to make some opening comments. Senator? Thank you, Justin David. Uh, it's uh, great to be uh, back at my alma mater, Anderson University, and it's uh, a pleasure to be a part of this task force. Uh, I think everyone here is taking the, uh, the charge of the task force very seriously. We've received a lot of input and I think there's a lot of thoughtful consideration being given, and uh, I'm just honored that the task force chose to uh, come into uh, uh, central Indiana to Anderson and, and my home district and, and uh, conduct this meeting. And I think uh, everyone on this committee is uh, very concerned about trying to make some good recommendations to solve the problem, and uh, I think they're all ears. So looking forward to it. Thank you, Senator. Also, I'd like to invite uh, Co-Vice Chair Representative Greg Sturwald to make comments. Thank you, Justice David. Uh, Justice David asked me to 
just make a few quick comments uh, about 1006 and the censoring reform we did, which took effect five years ago. Just very quickly, just to remind everybody the effort that was put into that and the hours that, and years that were uh, placed in trying to get the best policy for Indiana. It actually began in 2010. Uh, the Criminal Code Evaluation Commission was established. It had a number of uh, uh, very interested parties. We had a subcommittee chaired by Deborah Daniels that did an initial review uh, to, to make recommendation to the commission because it was such a, a huge task. There were 400 pages of the criminal code that we took a look at. From there, their recommendations were given to us. We formed very informally a committee that grew. It ended up being members from IPAC, the Public Defenders Commission, Department of Corrections, Probation Association, Community Corrections Association, the Judges Association, uh, the Sheriff's Association, and the Criminal Justice Institute, uh, all of whom were just great partners. Uh, we met a number of times. I've said this many times, it's purely my estimate, but between over those five years, we probably had 50, 60,000 man hours from everybody who were on the commission and what turned out to be the Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council. So it's just good to remind everybody what a thorough and long process, process that process that was and how we came up with the what was known to be 1006 the criminal code and sentencing reform just wanted to remind everybody the input that was given all the interested parties were very involved and it was uh, turned out to be a pretty good product we all thought so thank you thank you sir I would uh, note that uh, at least uh, one Madison County Judicial officers here, Judge Hoppy, and he will be presenting, and, and I received some texts and a couple emails from the other Madison County judicial officers. I don't recognize everybody, and some people that I recognize here, I can't remember the name. Uh, I, I do note that your uh, county prosecutor, Madison County prosecutor, Mr. Cummings, is here, so thank you for taking time from your schedule to, to be here, sir. Please remember, if you've not been asked to provide a presentation or have not signed up to speak or perhaps you have signed up um, it's a possibility that we may not get to you today I think we've had three or four people sign up so we anticipate being able to hear uh, all the public testimony of those that have signed up so far to do that you do have the opportunity to supplement any testimony if you haven't thought about submitting testimony or any presentations uh, to the task force you can do that online you can go to the website again all the way through November 8th at 3 p.m. and post 24 hours, seven days a week, whenever you're comfortable, whatever you want to tell us. Um, we're asking people to tell us what they uh, want to tell us, but if you can uh, uh, suggest what uh, is important for us to find, uh, what you think is important for us to conclude, and, and if you have some specific recommendations you want to, us to consider, uh, feel free to do that. We've been collecting those public comments, and again, uh, that's available to you 24-7. Our next meeting uh, presently is scheduled for November 25th at 1 p.m. in Indianapolis, and that will be an executive session. There may be a short public meeting, uh, and we will announce that uh, soon. The task force is required to submit its report and recommendations by December 1st, 2019. Those recommendations will go to the governor's office, uh, to the legislature, and uh, to the chief justice of the state of Indiana. This meeting, as I've alluded to, is being recorded and broadcast live on the internet. Um, in addition, for those of you that are interested, this meeting will be archived and placed on the task force website uh, for an extended period of time. Just a reminder, please turn your cell phones off. We don't want to interrupt the presenters or those providing public testimony. We don't want any distractions or diversions. So I just did that before we walked on the stage and hopefully I turned it off, not on. Uh, if I turn it on, we'll find that out probably, but I'm asking you to, to just check your cell phones. If you would also, one more request, and that is try to minimize or refrain altogether from the sidebar conversations or, or chatting amongst yourselves. Uh, if you need to take a call or need to do that, we'd ask you to just uh, step outside the auditorium for that time. At this time, I would ask the task force to review the draft, and draft minutes that were submitted. 
Uh, we previously circulated those, and uh, if, if you have reviewed those and you have any uh, changes or corrections, now would be the time to bring those to my attention. Uh, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes that were circulated previously? If not, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any members of the task force opposed to the approval of the minutes? See no opposition, motion carries. So we will begin our scheduled presentations. We have four presentations scheduled today. Each presenter's time will include taking questions from task force members. Following the presentations, we will then have a period of public uh, testimony. We have a monitor for us that are seated here. You have a monitor behind, so if you see us looking down, it's because it's a lot easier to look forward and down than it is to look over our shoulders, particularly uh, with the age that some of us, myself, um, have. So first of all, we're going to hear from the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Um, we'll have two presenters, um, Rebecca uh, Booner and Jay Chaudhry, Director, DMHA. But to introduce them and provide some opening perspective, Mr. Doug Hunsinger from the Governor's Office. Mr. Hunsinger. Thank you, Justice David, and uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, as we've heard in previous meetings, um, the mental health and addiction issues are an important um, aspect of the, um, of the issues of, that are contributing to jail overcrowding. And um, Governor Holcomb has made attacking the drug epidemic one of his top priorities um, of the administration. And so um, I, will, I will actually just turn it right over. I know um, uh, most of what I had, um, had planned to say will be covered in their presentation, so I don't want to duplicate. But um, I think Becky Buner, who's the Deputy Director for Addiction uh, Services, will be uh, kicking it off. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Thank the you very much. The floor is yours. Um, so as um, Doug mentioned, my name is Becky Buner. I'm the Deputy Director for Addiction and Forensic Treatment at the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. And I'm very excited um, to be here today to talk to you about our initiative around um, bringing and expanding e um, evidence-based practice treatment for substance use disorder to jails. Um, just some, some general uh, statistics related to the United States. 2.1 million individuals have an opiate use disorder, and that's as of 2017. Over six, or I'm sorry, 68% of the overdose deaths involve some form of opiate. Two thirds of the individuals who are incarcerated in either uh, a prison or a jail have substance use disorder. 17% um, of individuals in jail report regular use of opiates. And 77% of formerly incarcerated individuals with an opiate use disorder relapse within three months of their release. And then the, um, one of the only Indiana statistics that we have as of today related to jails is out of Marion County, and it's from the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice through Wayne State. And it's that one third of those who die from an accidental overdose in Marion County were in the county jail in the year prior to death, and most of them were, died within a week of release. And so that just kind of brings to the table the idea that we have to figure out how to get more treatment within some of our jails. Um, as it relates to Indiana data, um, the opiate-related deaths, as you can see, um, we still have as of 2019, and this data is updated as of October 25th, um, that we're still over 600, cl close to 700 opiate-related deaths. And this breaks it down based on gender, um, as you can tell, males uh, from the age of 25 to 44 are still the highest level of individuals that are having overdose. Um, I'm actually going to skip this slide because I was unable to verify the last date in which this data was updated, so I want to make sure that I get you the corrected data. Um, as, it looks to, as we look to arrests, um, just looking at 2018, 38% of the arrests in 2018 were drug-related. And thus far in 2019, 35% of arrests are drug-related. And then as we look and break down into what uh, it was the drug that was involved in those seizures or those arrests, as you can tell, opiates is still on this list. It's the very, um, the very bottom. The, um, but the biggest issue 
is uh, methamphetamine. And so as you can tell from the drug seizures that the rate that we are seizing methamphetamine is continuing to increase. And when we looked at this data, we took into consideration when we were trying to bring evidence-based practice to jails that we wanted to focus not only on opiates, but that we also wanted to bring evidence-based practice for all forms of substances because methamphetamine continues to be a huge problem, especially in some of our rural communities. We were fortunate recently to partner with the Pew MacArthur and some of um, the sheriffs in the room and some of the individuals might remember doing a survey with Pew MacArthur results first. And their survey focused strictly on medication assisted treatment offered in our county jails. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, the definition that they use for um, MAT is through SAMHSA and it's the use of medication in combination with counseling and behavioral therapies to provide that whole patient approach to treatment. And then they also considered the three FDA approved medications, uh, which are buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone. As Pew MacArthur um, conducted their survey, one of the great things is they, they had 59 respondents. Um, so when you consider of the, the 92 sheriffs, 91 jails, um, we had 59 respondents, which is over 56%. Um, out of that, uh, 39 um, actually said that they are doing some form of medication-assisted treatment in their jails. 18 of those stated they offered methadone, 19 naltrexone, and 11 buprenorphine. And then even better is that we had almost all of those 59 that were offering some form of naloxone or Narcan, which is the overdose reversal drug, as part of their jails. Um, two of the jails indicated that they offered all three forms of medication for opiate use disorder, and all of the jails that were doing some form of medication-assisted treatment said that the therapy or the counseling component is included in that process. What we found, though, when we started digging into what does it mean to actually access or offer medication-assisted treatment in jail, we found that it varied, the definition of that varied widely within the respondents. And so looking at this methadone, while um, 19 of them, I'm sorry, 18 of them said they offered methadone, only 75% said they actually offered it to um, pregnant women only. And then we had 10% that said they offered it to all incarcerated individuals. And everyone else was offered upon uh, release. And so it really breaks it down to show who was actually offering the methadone. It's really the focus for individuals who are pregnant, pregnant women. Also, thinking about naltrexone, um, the majority of times when naltrexone was offered, it was offered as a condition of release, and it was offered as the individual was leaving the jail, so it was just prior to release, not necessarily even 30 days. Some are doing 30 days, but most were doing it just prior to release, and then referring them to a treatment provider outside in the community for that follow-up naltrexone. So I really want to point out that some of the survey limitations while we had 56% response rate, um, only 13% actually followed up on the next level of question set. So when, we, when Pew reached out to say, um, how are you offering methadone? It's great that you're offering it. What does that look like? We only got a 13% response rate. And so uh, the findings for this study are not really generalizable because it's hard to say um, just that because one jail is doing it that all the other jails are doing it. And then also, there were discrepancies in the responses. So the individual survey response, when they called to do the follow-up, not everybody had the same answers. And so it was really hard to tell the consistency of what was being offered within the jail. But the really good thing, and what I would like to focus on, is what did it tell us? And so what it did share is that 83% of the individuals that answered the survey we're willing to participate in learning opportunities. So that tells me that folks are interested in the conversation, they're willing to hear what is evidence-based practice, what is medication-assisted treatment, and how could you potentially add it to your, your, continu your continuum of care within your jail. And they also identified barriers. Some of these barriers we already know, the concerns of diversion, it's pretty common. Folks are concerned that allowing the buprenorphine, for example, to come into the jail um, as part of treatment, that it might increase the diversion and more folks might get access to it. Also, big concern was lack of funding. 
and we actually did get some feedback that recovery works and that funding has been very helpful for some of the jails that are doing treatment, that it's allowed them not only to add treatment while they're in jail, but also continue that um, naltrexone shot, we heard a lot of that for the Vivitrol, and some of the therapy upon release. Um, but the biggest concern was that lack of funding and that the funding for the treatment falls with the county um, and that help from the state would be beneficial in this instance. And then we also heard that there was no standard for screening individuals. So when they talked to individuals about um, how are folks being identified, it was very inconsistent around um, the type of screening they used, whether or not medical professionals were even involved in the screening, and then how detailed. And most of it was based on an individual's um, just volunteering the information when they came in as that screening. And then another big concern is the inability to ensure access upon release. And so what we heard from the survey is that, especially in some rural communities, they would be okay with starting some type of jail treatment, but then were concerned that when that person walked out of jail, that they would not have access to treatment as a follow-up. And so they, did, they didn't want to start something that then wouldn't be able to be continued while, while in that community. And so some of the recommendations that they had for us um, really looking at continuing recovery works, potentially expanding recovery works, and focusing on the jail. And so um, one of the things that we have done related to recovery works is we reorganize the, the bucket of funding that is available and prioritized re-entry, which we are allowing to be provided to the state. Um, and that is $1,500. And this is based off of um, interviews and meetings that we did with folks that were already doing some form of treatment in a jail to say, what are you offering? How much are you offering? And what does that look like? And so $1,500 was a little bit more than the average. And so we wanted to make sure folks had access to that. The other thing is um, we, were, we had the program set up to be 90 days pre-release. And what we heard is that it's impossible to tell when someone's actually gonna get out of jail. And so doing 90 days pre-release was an arbitrary number that just caused additional paperwork and was not effective. And so we removed that and said, it doesn't matter how long the person's in there. From day one, they can access $1,500 worth of treatment and um, participate in any programming for evidence-based practice or um, substances or even mental health at that point. Um, the other recommendation was stakeholder education. And um, I will come back to this one a little bit here in a moment. Um, but we have several parties, uh, several stakeholders that have come together and are doing some education for sheriffs. We've partnered with Steve Luce with Indiana Sheriff's Association to really get in and do some more training and education around what is evidence-based practice and what is medication-assisted treatment. And then also maximizing MAT offerings. What this means is making sure that when someone is in jail that they have access to all three forms of the medications. Now that is logistically more difficult in some areas where we don't have direct access to an opiate treatment program as those are the only entities that can do methadone. However, we can figure out how to get access to at least buprenorphine and naltrexone and make that a priority. And in the areas where methadone is an option, we can definitely prioritize that as well. And then looking at best practices and mat delivery, meaning that we have consistency in our approach so that there's the same screening tool, the same assessment, and then the same options for evidence-based practice once, we, once that individual is identified. And care coordination. This goes back to the communication and the coordination and the partnerships between the jails and Department of Corrections and Department of Corrections in the community and the jails in the community. And how do we, can we foster and expand those partnerships and those relationships to make sure there's a continuum so that folks that are getting treatment within um, a facility can continue that treatment once they get on the outside. So one of the collaborative efforts, one of the partnerships that has been established, um, this is through the National Governors Association, and there were several partners, um, Doug Huntsinger with the governor's office, and then uh, um, Dr. Doss and Melody Turner from Department of Corrections, Steve Luce from the Indiana Sheriff's Association, and myself, had the opportunity to participate in an NGA in Cleveland earlier this year. And as a result of this, we started some very powerful partnerships. And 
came up with some immediate goals that we wanted to focus on. We left these very high and very general because we recognize that how we implement these are going to look very different depending on the community, knowing that every community is different. But really focusing on expanding access to evidence-based practice. So in general, substance use treatment, evidence-based practice for in individuals that are incarcerated, and then also looking at medication-assisted treatment in jails. And then a longer term goal as we move down the road is to really create a technical assistance center that can guide sheriffs um, and jail commanders as they come into office, knowing that they will change every 48 years. How can we offer them assistance in either implementing a program or continuing a program that was previously started? And then in addition to that, we have been partnering with Department of Corrections and the, the goal of this partnership is really to have a unified approach for addressing mental health and addiction needs regardless of the environment or the funding source. So Department of Corrections also receives some, some funding for jail treatment, and then we also have the Recovery Works funding, and then we have the, the partnership with the Governor's Office and ISA. And so really looking at coming together and identifying what is the screening tool that is being used in jails, what, and, and what is the screening tool being used in Department of Corrections? What is the assessment? And what, is, what are the evidence-based practices? And not necessarily requiring that the same one be used, but requiring that folks have understand the same language. And so when uh, we are looking at what is that screener in jail, that if that person does end up going to DOC, DOC is going to understand and, and um, welcome that, um, that screener and that assessment and that uh, treatment for the individuals. And so this has been a partnership with Dr. Doss and Julie Lannon from DOC. So we're very excited about this. Um, we have just starting on this path, and we hope to have Indiana protocols here in the next several months. Um, so oh, I apologize. So um, when we were out at the NGA, we had the opportunity to hear about other states that had successful partnerships. So I'm not going to go into to any detail on this. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that the task force was aware that there are other states that are, have been successful with um, implementing treatment as a whole system. So Rhode Island, through their Department of Corrections, understanding their state is very different in size. Um, but the, the philosophical practices and the ideas can, are very transferable to what we're doing. And one of the things that they did that uh, we are, are taking and moving forward is the education for all staff. And this goes back to what Pew MacArthur recommended for us making sure that we are educating everyone on what is opiate use disorder, substance use disorder, that it is a disease, and that there is treatment that can be effective for all of these. They also provide all three forms of, of medication. And one of the greatest outcomes that I've heard from them that they don't unfortunately have documented anywhere is just their morale with the correctional officers. And the correctional officers recognizing that they are not dealing with fights and the day-to-day -day negative interactions as often, and that folks that are in um, their, their facility are able to get the treatment they need so they can focus on their recovery and they can actually participate in class. So they are um, uh, much more open to receiving that treatment because they have that medication. And then the other one is Massachusetts. Massachusetts focused on Vivitrol. And one of the things that they noted um, is that they started with focusing on 30 days pre-release and found that their results were not as positive as if they went back to 90 days. And so having that 90 days pre-release um, allowed for more consistency and commitment to that person's recovery. Um, and so this is something that in, in many of the jails now where we have the 30 days or the pre-release, we're going to talk to them about potentially expanding that um, beyond just that 30 days. Um, so the, the partnership that we have right now with Indiana Sheriff's Association and the governor's office is, um, as I said, we are focusing on not just opiate use disorder and medication assisted treatment. While that is definitely a priority, we are also focusing on evidence-based practices for all substances. And so this partnership has only been possible with the governor's office help um, and his next level recovery agenda for addressing addiction um, because that allows us to fund treatment right now outside of opiates. We're using the state opiate response grant for funding treatment for medication assisted treatment, but we did not have the funding outside of that. So that's, this has been a great partnership 
Um, and the idea is that um, Steve Luce and the Sheriff's Association will assist us in being that technical assistance provider to make those connections. Um, and then as a team, we will help to expand treatment in different jails. Um, one of the other opportunities we have for training and technical assistance is we're starting a Project ECHO focused on jail treatment. Project ECHO is a training opportunity that happens approximately once a month, depending on the, um, the opportunity. And with that, individuals who are implementing treatment in jail can call in. It's through a Zoom, a, a, a web um, meeting, and they have a 30-minute presentation where they talk through something new and innovative or just a concept around evidence-based practice. And then the second part of that hour is where someone presents a case, where they can talk about that case to really look at, okay, what are some similarities? How did you handle this? How did you handle that? What are the concerns? And so they can talk through and staff that case. We are starting the, the map for jails here in, in, I believe, in January. There's also other technical assistance opportunities that we are encouraging our, um, our communities to tap into through the Opiate Response Network, um, in addition to what we're able to offer. And these are just some sources um, based on the presentation. So the last thing that I wanted to touch base on, which those numbers are really hard to see up there, um, hopefully you all have the handout around Recovery Works. Um, so we have been focusing and made a lot of changes with Recovery Works over the, the past year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we changed the buckets from just a general $7,500 for everyone to building that into three buckets, one for community-based treatment, one for re-entry that can be accessible while they're in an incarcerated, um, either at community corrections or a jail, and then also for recovery residences. So as you look at the numbers, um, we have enrolled over 48,000 individuals, and we have just over 11,000 that are active as of today in the program. Um, and then uh, when you look at the services that we offer, um, the top five services for 2020, recovery residents, skills training, uh, substance use groups, skills training group, and then intensive outpatient. And then those are the, the top five counties in which clients have been enrolled. Are there any questions? Questions? Mr. Powell? Thank you, uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a, I have a number of questions. Uh, is, it, is it Bruner or Booner? Booner. Booner. Ms. Booner. You said 38% of uh, uh, the arrests were drug-related. How did you define drug-related? Um, it's uh, based on the data that is submitted through uh, Management Performance Hub. So it's, uh, they are arrested for one of those, um, which I can bring that back up, arrested for one of those substances, something related to that. Did, you, did it include alcohol um, or marijuana? I, I don't believe it included alcohol. Um, I, to look back. Hold on. So Doug's, Doug's whispering in my ear saying that he didn't think marijuana or alcohol were included I, in those numbers. So do you know what the number would be if he included alcohol and marijuana? Um, no, I do okay. not know that. That's fine. And um, methamphetamine, you've talked about it being a, a chronic problem, a more serious problem currently than opiates. Is that, is that fair? In many rural communities, yes. And, there, and when you say MAT, uh, you mean medically assisted treatment. That's uh, methadone, um, naloxone, those kind of drugs that stop folks from going into withdrawal that allows them to function uh, if they have an opiate addiction. Is that fair? Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to be clear. For the presentation, I focus on medication-assisted treatment as it relates to opiate use disorder. There are other forms of medication-assisted treatment for alcohol, and there are studies right now for methamphetamine. So it is, um, the term I focus on today is specific, yes, right. to opiate use disorder. It's my understanding, though, there's no uh, good treatment, medically assisted treatment for meth addiction at this point. It's being studied, but there's nothing out there available. There, um, it is being studied. There are some evidence-based practices, though, that um, have been helpful. Uh, Matrix is one of them that we have helped to get folks trained that it has shown positive results for methamphetamine use. You, you showed a number of slides showing that some jails in Indiana provide MAT or medically assisted treatment. Is that correct? So the, the response was 59, and then... Um, that's, I'm at, just, that's, yeah. not my, that's not my question. You showed, you showed some slides showing jails providing treatment. Yes. Who pays for that? 
Um, in most of those instances, that is currently from the county. There are five jails right now that um, have uh, funding through the state opioid response. I'm sorry, three jails that have funding through the state opioid response uh, to provide, and those are the ones that are doing the methadone as well. Okay. Uh, my, my concern was that the primary cost is on the county, though. Yes. And you said Pew, uh, Pew uh, did a um, survey for you. Why Pew? Why did you select them? Um, they, uh, when we were looking into who, uh, who our options were, they, they stepped up to the top on that list. They volunteered? Yes. Okay. Also, medic Medicaid assisted treatment providers, is there, and let's start with treatment providers, is there a shortage of mental health and substance abuse treatment providers in Indiana, or do you know? I would say yes. And uh, we heard some information, or at least I heard some information from probation and community corrections officers recently that you changed in October of this year your requirements that if, if someone's going to get Recovery Works funding for medically assisted treatment, they have to be Medicaid qualified. Is that accurate? When the, previously they did not have to be medically Medicaid qualified. So I'm sorry. So for the community corrections facilities, they recovery it, works funding. For, so so for recovery works funding, our expectation is that our providers are Medicaid providers, and that is because of the population that we serve, um, based on it's 200 percent of the federal pot of poverty level. That is also the same as Medicaid. And the intent of Recovery Works was to provide that gap funding, not long-term funding. So that's why we required that all providers become Medicaid providers. And when did, that, when did that requirement go into effect? That requirement was effective July 1. We started on that process in um, November of last year. Do you have any idea how many providers were eliminated uh, because of that uh, requirement that were previously getting funding? Correct. So we had one provider that um, chose to withdraw, and then we had about 10, maybe 11 providers that were not fully uh, Medicaid eligible through, they weren't credentialed through the MCEs. And so we have entered into agreements with all of them that they could continue billing recovery works through that process. So we actually only lost one, and they at the time weren't providing recovery works anyway. Yeah, I heard some, uh, and I don't want to mention names, but I heard some probation and community corrections personnel indicate to me that they were surprised by that and were not informed that uh, the organ your, your uh, organization was making that change, kind of caught them off guard. Uh, how can, what can we do to improve that communication gap? Or yeah. have you taken some steps to do right. that? So we've actually heard that feedback prior to this, this recent change. And so we've been really focusing for the past nine months on how to enhance the recovery works, the, the funding. And one of those ways that we have done that is we are now doing trainings, not just with our mental health providers, but also with the criminal justice partners. And so we started that in September and have, September I believe- September of this year? Yes, yes. Um, so previously we relied on, because the referrals were from the criminal justice partner to the mental health substance use provider for, for the funding, we required, re relied on our mental health and addiction providers to really be that, that partner between the criminal justice partner. What we recognized is that was not an effective strategy. And so mo most recently we ha are revising that strategy. And I'm happy to say that the next training that we're doing, um, uh, I believe the middle of November, Department of Corrections is actually gonna be there and train um, with us. So we are really as an agency trying to expand and enhance our partnerships with our criminal justice providers. Because what we've recognized is that as, as much as our provider, our mental health providers really tried to be that go-between, it was not an effective relationship. And so we needed to be there front and center. So I, I appreciate that feedback and we are doing things now. Mr. Chairman, I have two more questions. Yes, sir. Quiet. Um, the Recovery Works funding is only available to felons, is that, or people charged with felonies, is that correct? Uh, yes, or a past felony and a current <coughs> involvement. So if possession of methamphetamine or heroin became a misdemeanor, uh, right now it's a level six felony, but if it were to become a misdemeanor, recovery works would not be available to them. That is correct. Uh, your data points, uh, you were talking about collecting data. Uh, relapse versus recovery, uh, in terms of the folks that have received recovery works, do we have any kind of data at this point to show what the impact has been in terms of getting folks healthy and, 
and uh, not relapsing? Do you, do you have any kind of data that you could share with us there? Um, so we have not focused our evaluation this time on relapse. We focus more on the re recidivism. And I have some pre preliminary uh, results from Dr. Brad Ray. Um, but the data, the numbers are still very small. And so I'm not prepared to share that with you today. But I do hope that we can get that out to you within the next couple of months. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. No, it's fine. Any other questions? Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, task force members. Um, my name is Jay Chaudhry, and uh, for a little under two months, I've been riding Becky's coattails as the new DMHA director. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm thrilled to be here um, to sort of highlight a couple different initiatives that we're focused on over the next year or so at DMHA, which I, which we think would will be of relevance to this uh, to this task force. It's important to note at this point these are very much in the sort of embryonic stage. Um, you know, I've spent the last two months, I think, doing a listening tour of sorts and trying to understand where some of our gaps are. Just by way of my background, I'm actually a lawyer by training, so for better or for worse, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and so I understand very, uh, very sort of intuitively the importance of sort of a seamless linkage between the justice system and the mental health and treatment addictions infrastructure. Um, and so I'm happy to answer questions at any point, although I will say for the most part, um, I think I can still lean on being fairly new, and I might turn to Becky and ask her to, to answer some of those questions at that point. Uh, and so these are two distinct areas, and I'm happy to elaborate um, as, as questions arise. So the first area is, is, is a small issue, but it's something that I think any sheriff will tell you is a major pain point um, at these county jails, and that's the issue of folks that are declared incompetent to stand trial, um, who are then, by Indiana law, they're committed to the Division of Mental Health and Addictions for placement in one of our uh, state psychiatric hospitals uh, for restoration services. Um, for a lot of reasons, which I'm now starting to unpack and understand, um, there has been a spike in those ICST, as we call them, IC incompetent stand style ICST referrals uh, over the last five years or so, and there's been no sort of corresponding increase in resources for our hospitals, and that's one of the reasons, although there's many other reasons, that have nothing to do with funding, um, that that backlog has increased to the point where now, um, you know, we've been getting lots of sort of concerned calls from, from sheriffs and, and family members and other folks about people that are on the waiting list for entry into our state psychiatric hospitals and uh, don't, have, don't have the ability to get in at this point. Um, the latest numbers I saw, the backlog was 74 forensic referrals and a total backlog of 150, so again, not a huge volume, but uh, these, are, these are really, really painful sticking points for a, lot of, uh, for a lot of our local sheriffs. And then from a human perspective, these are folks who, you know, quite frankly, have no business uh, you know, being in jails and need to be in a more therapeutic environment. So all that to say that's the problem. I'm at the stage now where we've identified and defined the problem, um, and so we're looking at some solutions for that. So I just wanted to put a plug in for um, you know, Mary Kay and the Supreme Court and Justice Goff have agreed to co-host uh, a meeting at some point in 2020 just so we can all get on the same page about these issues because it is uh, currently, I just want you to know, currently it's an unacceptable state of affairs um, from, from DMHA standpoint and we're committed to uh, reducing and then eventually eliminating that backlog um, to get folks uh, into a more appropriate, um, appropriate setting for their particular conditions. So. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. I think I'm starting to understand the problem and come up with some solutions. This is not unique to Indiana. This is something that, um, that, that, that is sort of a trend nationwide. Um, you know, I think we're somewhere in the middle, frankly, in terms of both the, the volume of the backlog and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the length of time on the wait lists, which are probably the two, uh, the two key metrics there when you're looking at that, at that conversation. Um, and the second, and then the second point is completely not completely unrelated, but it, it, it is something that, uh, that I wanted to, to bring up. And so, and th this involves, like, what, what I'm hoping is uh, a, a somewhat of a, a perspective and paradigm shift from the treatment world. Um, I think there's been, and I think it's, uh, people have probably seen it, there is a reluctance on the behalf of, of people in the treatment world, which is again a broad brush, but people in the treatment world to, uh, 
to, the, to, 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 to come to terms with the idea that the justice system is our uh, number one entry into, into treatment. Um, and what I would like to do and like to sort of help lead the charge for our providers to do is instead of you know, running away from the rea that reality to instead embrace it. Um, I think as we all know, there are some positives that come with the justice system referral to treatment and, 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 and recovery. And um, so one of the things that we're looking at is we'd like to use a sequential intercept model um, as, as, as a guide to identify exactly where on each of those intercepts the gaps are, um, in, in, in the, the gaps are, what are the appropriate treatment and what can we do as DMHA to strengthen those linkages because that's an appropriate role for, for, for us at the state and it's something that we're very committed to over the next year or so. So that's, Thank you. I, I think we're about out of time, so if, if, if you would stay for just a moment. Any, any task force members have, have any questions? I, I have one question, and, and you can defer to Becky if, 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 if you're more comfortable, and that, and that is just trying to, uh, um, I've known a number of sheriffs over the years, fortunately not in a professional being their detainee, but, but uh, as a trial judge and, and as a citizen of the state, and if I were a brand new elected sheriff, even if I had law enforcement uh, experience, uh, what what one or two, three things you can tell us that 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 um, as a new sheriff or as an existing sheriff could reach out to DMHA and 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 get some get some help on? I mean, are you are you about to launch some tiger teams that can come to a county and say this is what we can do for you and Here's our incentives to help you, and um, or is that already in the works? Just what would you like? I think we're sort of in the planning to launch those the, the, those team stage. So we have to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, that's but it is. But what I would say to, to any sheriff or any law enforcement or any drug court or anybody that's on the ground here is let us know where those gaps are between uh, the referral because you know we use the word referral I think as a very sort of blanket term like the, the referral to treatment. What I think is missing there is, is, is the notion and the fact, frankly, that the more barriers you put into place between the referral and actual entry into treatment, you're losing people along the way. And those, ga those, those barriers can be as simple as, hey, call this number, make an appointment, you're losing people there, okay? And so I think our responsibility uh, as, as DMHA and as a treatment system is, 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 is to bring our services to where people are. Okay, and the justice system is a community access point that we, um, you know, need to have a presence at. And so that's, that's I think, the, the first question to sheriffs, and I think Mary Kay and I are going to work on a survey to the problem-solving courts um, at, at, as a start is, you know, what are, what are those gaps? What are those barriers? How can we turn something from a referral into just part of the system? Because that's, I think, where we can really make a difference. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. Our second presentation is uh, from a member, or from the executive director, excuse me, of the Indiana Sheriff's Association, Steve Luce. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the committee for allowing the ISA to participate in the public hearings. Jail overcrowding is a serious matter, and I appreciate your time and effort that you have personally invested while serving on this committee. The community has a huge job ahead in bringing the right solutions to chip away at jail overcrowding, and this will take time. I believe that creating a vision that involves a strategic plan over the next four to six years can allow us to chip away at what is nearly causing half the Indiana jails to be overcrowded. We are several years down the road since the inception of House Bill 1006. One thing I can tell you is that the legislation has allowed more collaboration with legislators, state associations, and criminal justice stakeholders, both lo local and state. I don't think anyone expected as a House Bill 1006 rolled out to find our communities fighting the opioid crisis 
and to follow methamphetamine use back on the rise. I truly believe good things have come from House Bill 1006, but I also believe we are not hitting on all cylinders. We all have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and put more time in on making sure right, the right pieces are in the place. This project is not a one and done. We have attacked jail overcrowding from many angles while balancing enforcement, education, and treatment in our communities. Having the right infrastructure in a jail, along with collaboration from all criminal justice stakeholders, can allow a county to be successful, which we saw a presentation in an example would be Porter County. The Indiana Sheriff's Association supports 92 sheriffs. My point is all have their own personalities and identity. I have to keep this in mind at all times. As this committee brings solutions to jail overcrowding, remember all counties have their own identity. Your solutions may have to allow peer-to-peer -peer review involving sheriffs, judges, prosecutors, public defenders, and probation. If trends are identified in that contribute to jail overcrowding. The discussion should always include the county commissioners and councilmen. No one owns this. We are all in this together. One of the things that we have been uh, talking about uh, quite often and staying consistent with our message with the Sheriff's Association is jail data. Preventing jail data requires a fundamental understanding of the jail's offender population including the differences between sentenced and unsentenced offenders, felony and misdemeanor offenders, and rate of admissions as opposed to the rate of release. Changes in the rate of admissions or length of stay can dramatically impact the number of offenders in a jail daily. Effectively preventing overcrowding requires the capability for collecting data, monitoring the population, analyzing offender admissions and lengths of stay, and sharing this information with key stakeholders and local jurisdictions. It is essential that criminal justice leaders and policy officials collaborate and use this information to develop sound policies and practices with regard to offender jail missions and length of stay. The state of Washington designed a system that interfaces successfully through the sharing of electronic data. This system was created by legislation that required the implementation of an electronic statewide and county jail booking and reporting system. The system serves as a central repository and an instant information source for offender information and statistical data and is capable of communicating electronically with each of Washington's city and county jails as well as other state and criminal justice agencies. The system allows the entry and retrieval of real-time and historical information on offenders held in each state around the state. It also provides ad hoc reports and summary data at predetermined intervals for use of managing the jails within Washington and for automated victim notification. Mental health issues. Offenders with severe mental illness generally have acute and chronic mental illness that function poorly in the community. Many are homeless and growing number of these mentally ill offenders are housed within jails and prisons throughout the country. In most jurisdictions, jails are poorly equipped to deal with this population. Factors that contribute to the placement of mentally ill persons into the criminal justice system include Communities lack of adequate support for persons with mental illness, mentally ill offenders, difficulty in gaining access to community treatment, and a lack of understanding by law enforcement and society of the mentally ill. A factor identified by many as an area that if addressed would save jail beds and costs associated with housing mentally ill offenders. It is the time it takes for the forensic evaluation process to be completed. These mentally, in some counties, offenders are housed in jails for extended periods of time awaiting competency hearings. These mentally ill offenders could be referred to an appropriate mentally health agency for services before the trial or at an early stage in the criminal justice process or begin receiving treatment immediately. Jails would benefit from the decrease in jail time and medical costs as well as their need to address 
the security risk associated with housing of mentally ill inmates. We have a lot of work to do that's ahead of us. The ISA and the Indiana sheriffs are looking forward to your solutions in addressing jail overcrowding. A year ago, we had 51 new sheriffs elected to their first term in office. This could mean new ideas and new visions. We currently have many second term sheriffs continually attacking the overcrowding issues and keeping the lid on the pressure cooker. Keep in mind when an individual is arrested, they will always come to the jail first. We need to make sure at this point we are addressing your needs better. It will take more time and effort from all of us, but investing revenue smart and with the use of real-time data, your solutions can bring a better outlook for the county jail populations. In closing, thank you for your time and dedication to this important issue in our communities across Indiana. Thank you, sir. Questions? Representative Sturwald? Yes, thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to publicly uh, thank you and the Sheriff's Association for being just an amazing partner at 1006. You've been supportive throughout, and I appreciate that very much. The other question is, you mentioned Washington State and their jail data collection, and it was there's a statute that enabled that or made that uh, to happen. I, I know you mentioned in another meeting earlier that um, you have an RFQ to interface with all the j current jail systems. Is that the same thing that's going to yeah, happen I, I here? Yeah, I the solutions are going to be very similar to what we're trying to accomplish here. Is there anything from this committee or the General Assembly you need to help with that RFQ and get that implemented? Um, I would say make, make it a, uh, be, be an advocate for it. Uh, we have to make sure what we're going to create, that that data has value to everybody in this room. And if people are not going to use it, it's not going to, we're not going to get the good solutions we need. Or so I, I believe when I travel around the United States, um, it seems everyone lacks jail data, real-time jail data. And I, I uh, really believe that having that real-time data will allow um, a county, the state of Indiana, to identify those trends that need to be addressed early on as opposed to finding out later when we're knee deep into it, what has been going on. And we'll be able to shift our resources, maybe not have to allocate new dollars, but shift resources to the problem. Well, I think it's gonna be one of the greatest sources of data for us to make decisions that we've done. So whatever we can do to help and expedite that, uh, we will be more than happy to do so. Other questions, comments? But yes, sure. yes. This may go back to some of Becca's comments as well. But as you have heard, we have old, lots of data problems across the country. We share many of the same customers among our sheriffs and the DOC. One of my questions would be if we can get a standardized screening instrument for substance use disorders, mental illness. Those are kind of quasi or fully considered medical data, right? It would be helpful to us to be able to share that among the sheriffs and with the DOC so when we get those, data points that folks can actually look at them. Because one of the, the barriers that we have today is if it's medical information, I can look at it sometimes within my own jail, but I would probably be reluctant to share it with DOC or the other sheriffs, even though we should be doing that. I think that, uh, Representative Sturwald, could be an opportunity for DMHA and us all and you folks to work together to give us the ability to share that stuff just within our circles, not publicly, but, but out there. Do you see that in our data project as a possibility of something that we can work together on? So I think that is definitely one of the biggest concerns and barriers that we have heard is not only the collection of jail data, as Steve Luce mentioned, but also just how, how do we share that. Um, so we are working on some tools right now, um, even there's one that's a computer adaptive, to, to really identify what is the best screener. And then also part of that conversation will be how do we make sure that it gets shared across that continuum. And that was one of the barriers that was identified through the Pew. Um, survey as well. Thanks. Yeah. If I can make an additional comment, um, the doctor who just spoke, when he talked about one of the more, more important things I've heard in these three me meetings is being able to fill the gaps. You know, I think overall we have done some really good things. And when I look at this, and I've spent a lot of time the last uh, several years with school safety, this may be another issue. 
but where we have failed over the years with school safety is everybody focused on that final event. It was the intervention and prevention that we've not filled the gaps. And if we can do a better job of filling the gaps, I think long term you're going to see better numbers uh, in our criminal justice system. Other questions? Thanks, Steve. Thank you. And we'll now have presentation of Indiana Prosecuting Attorney's Counsel, Mr. David Powell. Good afternoon, sir. Justice David, good afternoon. Am I doing something wrong here? There we go. I, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit today. Obviously, I represent Indiana's 91 elected prosecutors. Uh, and want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I would say something about 1006. Uh, as Representative Sturwald said a long time, I've been immersed in that project since 2011. Uh, our organization uh, played a, a major role in writing much of the, of the criminal code along with the public defenders. It was a, an effort, uh, really a joint effort, uh, between our two organizations to create a product that uh, prosecutors and uh, the rest of the folks could support. And, and everybody had issues with components of it. I mean, it wasn't a perfect, didn't make everybody completely happy, but that's politics and that's, that's legislation. But we supported the project. And that phase has been rolled out, and I think it's accomplished uh, essentially what it set out to accomplish. Uh, we knew that there would be some issues in the local community. Uh, at the end of the, uh, I came on the Criminal Code Commission in the fall of 2011, after it had been going for about a year and was there for the final vote. And, I, I voted against the product coming out of the commission, uh, and I was the only vote against it. And my rationale wasn't that I was opposed to criminal code reform, uh, because we needed to do some work. It hadn't been touched in 40 years, and it was out of proportion. All the things that Representative Sturwald has said many times are accurate, and that work needed to be done. But I had come from the local community. I'd been an elected prosecutor for 20 years, and I was concerned then that uh, we didn't have a good understanding of the lack of resources in local communities, and, and this and it was pretty clear that this product was going to put more responsibility on local communities uh, to reform offenders. Uh, and so the issue was, could they handle it? And, and my concern was, I didn't know. I was worried we couldn't. Uh, now, uh, that takes us to criminal filings and trends. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's fair to criticize 1006. I think that's really inappropriate. I think what we should say is that phase one is over. It accomplished what it set out to accomplish. We're in phase two, uh, which is the impact of criminal justice reform and the impact of what's going on in our society, and how do we how do we respond in this phase uh, to complete the product, to complete the project? So, I've been looking at criminal filings. Uh, Indiana prosecuting attorneys are one of the few in the country that has its own case management system. Uh, IPAC provides that system free of charge to all of the prosecuting attorneys in the state, and all but one county takes advantage of this product. So this data comes from our system. Now, I will say it has flaws, and it's not, it's not like the Supreme Court's record system, which is the official court record. Uh, we're not the official court record, uh, but it is helpful because uh, it, it gives me an idea. And you may say, why at IPAC do we care about this? Well, we're also responsible for training our 91 electeds and all of their staff and all of their their support staff and deputy prosecutors were, were responsible for their CLE, and we have a one-third turnover every four years in elected prosecutors. And it's just whether they become judges, whether they retire, whether they get defeated, uh, whether they go on to something else, it's just pretty, pretty standard, uh, about a one-third. And so my responsibility, our responsibility at the Prosecuting Attorney's Council is what do we train people? And it's, it's a, the philosophy is, well, we should train them on what they do the most of. They got to be really, really good at some things because they do them every day. So what is it we do the most of and, and why is it important? Now, this is just kind of total filings from 2015, which happens to be kind of the, when 1006 got off, off the ground. The good news is that when 1006 went on, came on board, criminal filings were falling and had been falling for a few years. Uh, and if that trend had kept up, meaning fewer people were committing crimes, we wouldn't quite have the problem we have today. Now, the other thing that 1006 did is it, as it right, right sized the criminal code, it created more level or F6 offenses. So we knew that there were going to be more F6s, and we knew that they were not necessarily going to go to the Department of Corrections, 
when they had in the past gone to the Department of Corrections. So the, the interesting part was what's, what's that impact going to be? One could say that if you were in an area of high crime and, and high population growth and your jail was crowded in 2011, it was going to be a big problem for you going forward. And I think Vandenberg County is a good example of that. They were crowded when this started uh, with their population growth and the changes uh, they should have expected to have uh, more problems unless they built a larger jail. But anyway, these are the rough numbers. As you can see, the bulk of the works, felonies is F6. The good news is not a lot of murders, not a lot of very, very serious crimes. Uh, but the bulk of the work we do is misdemeanors. Uh, and by that, I mean criminal justice partners is misdemeanors and uh, levels, low level felonies. So what are our top 10? Uh, this is hard to read, but it's important because of the discussion about drugs. Since uh, 2017, our number one felony has been possession of methamphetamine, and it is increasing dramatically. Uh, if you look at uh, 2015 uh, uh, and look for meth, there were 4,000 criminal filings, 4,194. And uh, last year in 2018, there were 11,606. And this year to date, we're at that number. Uh, that's a big problem. And folks with methamphetamine addiction are hard to fix, hard to cure. There is no MAT, and, and it is a very, very cr serious problem in local communities. And so, but it's our number one felony. And oh, by the way, if it keeps increasing at the same percentage, in four years, it'll exceed driving while suspended, our number one misdemeanor. That's an unacceptable uh, outcome for us in four years. So you can see syringe possession. It's not, by the way, it's not a crime to possess a syringe. <laughs> Anybody can get a syringe. You can go buy them in a any, any drug store. What, what, why syringe position is a felony? It's a, it's a felony to possess a syringe with heroin in it, methamphetamine in it, or cocaine in it. So that's, but that number is increasing too, and it makes sense because folks prefer to use methamphetamine and heroin with a syringe. So we would expect those numbers to go up. The good news is, is the opiate numbers are falling. There's been a lot of work, good work done by the governor's office, the General Assembly, uh, and, the, and the judiciary uh, on this issue, and uh, that, that trend is going in the, trending in the right direction. The scary part is it looks like meth is uh, filling the gap. Uh, so those are your top ten uh, felonies that are filed in our state and have been for the last few years. Here are your top ten misdemeanors. The king of the pack has been forever. is driving while suspended. There's been a lot of interest in trying to work on this because many of those cases are related uh, to poverty can't pay reinstatement fees. Nobody likes prosecuting those cases. Uh, we're working currently with a number of legislators and public defenders council and the BMB to try to address that issue to reduce those numbers because those take a lot of time. 22,758 of those misdemeanors take up a lot of court time, a lot of prosecutor time, a lot of public defender, a lot of probation, community corrections time. But marijuana is up there. It's number two. Paraphernalia, which can include a syringe, a bong, uh, lots of devices that are used to ingest uh, narcotics and operating while intoxicated. So again, those are your top 10 uh, misdemeanor filings. And the reason I want to talk about that is if you take those top 10 felonies and you take those top 10 misdemeanors and lay them across the criminal code and what we file, it's over 63% of our workload, those 20 crimes. So from a training perspective at IPAC, and I would suggest that at the judiciary and, and uh, sheriffs and probation officers, we got to be really, really good at these offenses, at treating people, at helping people. we got to all be experts at this because this is our workload. This is what we do day in and day out. Uh, and we really have to be masters at trying to uh, reduce uh, these numbers. If we can, everything gets better rapidly. Sadly, we don't do really well with uh, stopping substance abuse and the data is everywhere to support that but these are these are the these are this is what we do every day day in day out so uh, all of the top 10 offenses since 2015 have been level sixes four of those top 10 felonies are substance abuse related um, five of your top 10 misdemeanors are substance abuse related that includes alcohol we include that in our substance abuse discussion because it is still probably our number one problem uh, out there. And of course, I put this bullet up about reason, the reason I asked the question of, of uh, 
FSSA earlier on the recovery works issue is misdemeanors. You know, this, this, the bulk of our folks that are getting in trouble are misdemeanors, and this recovery works funding is not available to them. And many people who are committing property crimes, uh, domestic violence, batteries, neglect, have substance abuse problems. I think I've heard from uh, the Department of Health, I've heard from uh, FSA, uh, lots of folks, sheriffs, Department of Corrections, that almost everybody that's incarcerated has a substance abuse problem, whether they're there for that problem or not. And so uh, we really shouldn't wait for fel folks to become felons to get recovery works <coughs> funds. Why should you have to be a felon to get help? Uh, we ought to find a way to make those funds available as soon as someone's assessed with a substance abuse problem. And let's prevent them from becoming a felon if we can. That, that serves no one's purpose. So misdemeanors truly are a local burden. Um, I mean, they're in your community. They're the bulk of the folks, sheriffs, probation officers, judges, community correct prosecutors, public defenders. Uh, they are a local issue. And if those numbers increase in any way, they're going to impact the jail negatively and they're going to impact your resources. So uh, just some kind of, if you like, numbers. Drug dealing charges are up 197%, 16. Possession's up 88% based on our data. Uh, things are just going in the wrong possession, wrong way for drugs uh, and substance abuse. That's why it's so important, important that public health, uh, you know, become a full-blown partner with criminal justice folks uh, to help deal with this crisis that we're in. This slide tells everything to me. It comes from SAMHSA. I've, I've shown it before. Um, according to SAMHSA, uh, which are the national folks that study drugs, of the 17.1 million people who are substance abusers, uh, only 6% think they have a problem. 94% of the community, the world, not just criminals, everybody, who has a substance abuse addiction do not think they have a problem. And if you don't think you have a problem, <laughs> you're not going to seek help for it. And so that is, a, that is very, very concerning. Uh, it is a national problem. And, and of that said, and I was listening uh, to the report earlier, uh, and, and it was reported to us that 2.1 of these, 2.1 million of these folks have an opiate abuse disorder. Well, if you take 2.1, that leaves 15 million Americans that are addicted to alcohol, meth, I suppose tobacco may be in that list, but we've got a real problem uh, in this country with that stuff. So, to me, if we can find a way to reduce use and, and reduce the demand and, and take the supply off the streets, uh, it will have a dramatic impact, positive impact on everyone involved, including jails and sheriffs. So what are sheriffs doing in Indiana? We, we, we have a public information officer and we've asked him to track media on who's building jails in Indiana and what's in the paper. And this is just stuff, I'm sure it's not all of them, uh, but this is just stuff we pulled from the news. It uh, shows names counties, that it, these are six counties that have, are building or have built jails in the last year. Um, you can see the dollars spent and the beds that have been added. Some of these are rural counties. Uh, some of them are not so rural, larger communities. Um, just kind of seven counties that are, have said in the media that they're going to um, build new jails in the future. Those add up to 2,245 new beds and a quarter of a billion dollars. And of course, we know this is funded primarily locally. Five counties are exploring, five counties that have built new jails. Essentially, we know that 6,400 beds have been added in 13 counties that are currently building or proposing to build. And in those 18 counties mentioned above, it's over a billion dollars in local tax dollars that are going to be spent um, out of local funds to build jails. And that's just what we're pulling out. We pulled at our office out of the media. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of beds being added. Uh, and of course, we know that some counties are being sued and forced by litigation to add these jails. So that's, that's kind of the situational awareness we're in and, and what we're dealing with and really why this this study's going on. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest in diversion and we're working on that, the Prosecuting Attorneys Council and with uh, the state EBDM team and others and Justice uh, Recovery Works Act. Just wanted to kind of share some things we pulled out of our system. We've had misdemeanor diversion forever. Uh, 
Um, and essentially the way it worked with prosecutors and was when, when it was given to us by the General Assembly was if it was your first criminal offense and it was a misdemeanor and you paid the statutory fee and you stayed out of trouble for a year, your case was dismissed. There was no treatment, you know, no requirement to do services and it's worked pretty well. Now there are some offenses like drunk driving that you can't legislate that are prohibited from uh, diverting. But if you're curious about what our system shows, about 10% of the misdemeanors that were filed were diverted uh, last year. So 13,024 out of the 123 in our system. We're working on data and trying to improve our system so we can track this better. Uh, Representative Sturwald and 1006 gave us felony diversion uh, for, uh, level, for level five and level six felons. There hasn't been a great deal of work done on that because of basically it should be explanatory. The numbers, a lot of these folks have chronic substance abuse problems. And if your rural community doesn't have a treatment center, the worst thing you can do with a meth addict is, <laughs> is divert him or divert her. Uh, they're just going to keep stealing and stay with their addiction. And so uh, we're working at IPAC on guidelines. We have a standing committee uh, that are working on this. We're looking at developing pilot sites, trying to create some expectations, working with the state EBDM team and JRAC, a screening tool possibly. We heard one of these tools we do need, and Sheriff Clark, you mentioned it, is if we're going to divert a, a, a person with a chronic substance abuse problem, we've got to know what it is, we've got to know what their needs are, because we don't want to make their situation worse. And of course, we've got to work together collaboratively. Uh, and I think uh, I agree with uh, Sheriff Luce. Uh, the one thing that's really come out of 1006 that's been wonderful and really set Indiana apart is, and, and to some part led by the Supreme Court, has been the collaborative nature of this conversation uh, that all the criminal justice partners have had. I want to talk about the future a little bit. I like looking at and thinking, you know, kind of big and about what our population is going to do and what impact this would have on criminal justice and jails and all this money we're spending. If you go to the Kelly School of Business IU site, they have all these data points and projections for the future. And by and large, they've been pretty close. They say that uh, there's going to be a 70% increase in people over 65 by 2050. People over 65 don't commit crime. So crime rates should fall. They also say that Indianapolis and the 10 counties around it are going to account for 70% of the population growth and 33% of the state's population by 2050. That's where the crime's going to be. That's where the resources are going to be required. What's interesting is that the four corners of the state, Vandenberg County, Fort Wayne, Gary, greater Louisville area, are also going to increase. But here's the difficult part. 60 of the 92 counties in the middle are going to shrink. And by 2035, 15 years from now, the average age of a Hoosier will be 40. People, you know, I've been in this business a long time, 40 years, we're not locking up 40 year olds. So what we're gonna see, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna build all these jails. And in 15 years, just because of the demographic nature, uh, our populations in rural counties are gonna shrink, they're gonna get older, crime rates are gonna fall, and the crime rates are gonna be focused on the urban areas the large metro areas where the youth will be and the growth is, and we're going to have a lot of space. Uh, and uh, if we can, so it's kind of urgent that we deal with this because the worst thing we could do is ask a small county to add 400 beds and then 10 years from now, 300 will be empty. That would be good news if it happens. I hope that happens, candidly, but that's why it's important to talk about this and work on it and think about it. Uh, and I don't have all the solutions, but some things what I would like to suggest is that we support legislation creating a collaborative EBDM structure. We've talked about that, combining JRAC and the state team that can continue to work on these public safety and public health issues. We all know, not, not just with the jails, but we need a reliable statewide data system. We have to reduce demand, and we can't prosecute our way out of it, but we've got to figure out ways to work together to stop folks from trying drugs and getting into this business with us uh, to begin with. And then we need to figure out how to support capacity building in every community, every community, uh, to increase uh, mental health and substance abuse uh, infrastructures. So those are my comments. I'll answer any questions if I can. Questions for Mr. Powell? Now's your chance. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Dave, for all the work that you, you and IPAC have done and uh, uh, been very supportive of 1006. I, I understand how complicated that process was, and, and uh, all of us on JRAC thought there were some really good points. 
in 1006 and some of us thought there might be room for improvement. But I wanted to bring out, a, a, I think you eliminated a, a myth. Wasn't there, at one point in time, there was a belief that forced treatment uh, was not effective. Well, but didn't you have a discussion with me and said there's been some studies to well, show Well, if you went to the opiate, uh, the Chief Justice Opiate Summit and head of the drug courts in America came that the most effective way of getting into treatment was coercive treatment, the threat. And it doesn't have to be the threat of going to jail. It could be the threat of losing your job, the threat of your spouse leaving you, the threat of losing your children, or going to jail. And, and that's why drug courts work. It's, it, it's some folks, especially when you have 96% of the population, I don't have a problem. Well, you do have a problem. And until they're, so on their own, they're not going to volunteer to do it. And so that's where the criminal justice system, that's where public health, we can help public health. We can create a lever to get people into treatment. And if, oh, by the way, if they succeed, then let's reward them. You know, whether that's reduce the sentence or, you know, or give them an expungement or whatever. Uh, but that's, that's the real aid we can help. And I think one of the uh, uh, biggest issues we have is getting make, making sure that misdemeanors are eligible for this process. It's a big uh, price tag, but yes, yep. I think for it to work long term, we have to consider that. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Powell. Indiana Public Defender Council, Mr. Cornell. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Justice David. Uh, I'm Mark Carnell, I'm here for the Indiana Public Defender Council. Bernice Corley, our executive director, is out of state at a training conference and I will make unable to make it. However, this was important enough to her that uh, she wanted our, the, the council to have its presentation. Uh, the Public Defender Council represents public defenders in Indiana, which unlike the prosecutors is a more distributed uh, system. There are some places where there are full-time public defender offices, there are some places where there's part-time offices, and in some places, in some counties, there are uh, public defenders appointed on a case-by-case -case basis. <coughs> Effective solutions cannot be created without correctly identifying underlying causes. Uh, numerous articles and stakeholders have attributed overcrowding to the implementation 1006. However, um, that's not exactly the case or not completely the case, I should say. This is not a new problem. Uh, this is from an article from the Indy Star in uh, 2016, uh, quoting Andrew Falk, who was then a senior fellow with the Sagamore Institute, noting that 30% uh, of the jails were overcrowded then. Not a new problem, and overcrowding is one of the issues that led to the creation of the, of the commission that eventually led to 1006. As Mr. Powell mentioned earlier, and we are pleased to be able to work with uh, Dave and uh, Sheriff Luce and the other stakeholders on these issues. Uh, several counties have been sued prior to 2014 for jail overcrowding and jail overcrowding conditions. Uh, two of the counties that are on this uh, list provided by the ACLU are still actually under uh, monitoring agreements. Uh, also from the Department of Correction in a 2017 report to an interim study committee uh, looked at 56% of the jail population then were pretrial detainees and 45% of the beds were filled with level 6 inmates. However, only 10% of those level 6 inmates were sentenced and 40 jails were over capacity. So even if every sentence level 6 inmate was sent to the Department of Correction, 31 jails would still be over capacity. And continuing with that, those 40 over capacity if one half of the pretrial population were released to supervision or some other uh, pretrial um, alternative, only 12 jails would be under capacity. And Porter County, as mentioned earlier, is an example of how this could happen and be done well. Um, some solutions are actually contributing factors. Uh, pretrial detention, the use of um, Jail detention for those with mental illness and or drug addiction, as we've heard from DMHA earlier. Uh, arrest versus site and release and bail practices right now lead to, uh, in the Public Defender Council's view, uh, some of the overcrowding. And the use of jail in lieu of some other treatment. So uh, we would also su suggest that uh, these are criminalizing behaviors 
that could probably be treated with a needs-based response. So some of the solutions that the Public Defender Council would suggest are, uh, as mentioned before, uh, funding the Public Defender Commission, another uh, public defense agency, so they could reimburse for misdemeanor cases. Misdemeanors are the num by and far the number one kind of criminal charge filed. Uh, however, the commission lacks the ability statutorily to reimburse for misdemeanors. This would have a rather modest fiscal increase, although when I say modest, we're still talking about $6 million to uh, do that. And also uh, another, uh, another reform, another improvement that the council has been seeking uh, has been to have the uh, public defender, if appropriate, for an indigent case appointed at the beginning of the initial hearing. Uh, research has shown that if the individual is represented at the initial hearing, uh, release outcomes are much higher. Uh, there's somebody there to advocate, there's somebody there to bring forth, especially a lot of these folks uh, aren't aware of their own rights and nobody's there to advocate for them and bring up these alternatives. Both of those initiatives were filed in bills uh, in the last legislative session, there was discussion. However, there wasn't progress. Uh, we would ask that those be considered again. Uh, bail practices, uh, we would suggest a statewide bail schedule and terminate the use of local bail schedules. This leads to a great disparity between counties. Uh, however, we also recognize that this is a, a judicial discretion issue. Um, but having more standardization across the state would, ad would address fairness and also may be used to reduce uh, pretrial incarceration. We would also encourage the um, release of low-risk offenders and discourage the use of release conditions if they're not necessary and appropriate. Uh, using conditions that are uh, not necessary increases often the financial burden, especially with uh, community corrections or pretrial monitoring. And additional conditions, if they're not a not appropriate, may result in the violation of terms on a more frequent basis, which then, of course, results in reincarceration. We would also suggest uh, building treatment systems or building out better treatment systems, more treatment systems that are separate from the criminal justice system. Uh, using the criminal justice system as treatment, which is the de facto way that this has evolved, uh, in our view, compromises the, the criminal justice system because like with drug courts and that it causes it's a tension between the uh, the needs of the offender versus the needs of justice and needs of society if we could remove these people from the criminal justice system earlier when appropriate we would be able to focus on their needs and society's needs could also be taken care of separately hand in hand with this we would suggest the diversion and into a treatment model for minor victimless crimes and nonviolent crimes that involve victims should be into a restorative justice model. As mentioned earlier by uh, Dave Powell, we are moving into a second phase of 1006. We would suggest that this be a more formalized uh, council and state governments of readjust, justice reinvestment in the Ann analysis report in 2010 looked at some of this and suggested a additional uh, and reinvestment strategies. Uh, and one of the things that comes through here is that data is necessary. And I think that we're all in agreement in this, with this, that we need more data. And for example, this is from a Vera Institute report. The Vera Institute is a, uh, works with, with varied stakeholders to address uh, injustices or what are perceived injustices which have the same effect as injustices unfortunately uh, if this could be collected in real time as Sheriff Luce indicated using the Washington model we would have better ideas and better able to respond in a more timely way this is part of a from a report on Jackson County there's a second page from that although that's hard to read this table shows what the purpose is, what the reason for incarceration for the people in the jail at that snapshot between July and September 2019. Uh, possession of methamphetamine and direct contempt are the two largest categories there, which I'm kind of surprised direct contempt, but uh, that's the way it was in Jackson County. Uh, while respecting judicial discretion, we would also encourage having judges consider alternatives to incarcerate incarceration when appropriate. Uh, if treatment's indicated, 
we would encourage trial courts to move people to treatment. Once again, respecting judicial discretion. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time and interest and the opportunity to speak today, and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mark. Members of the commission, have any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And again, all of the presentations have been provided to the task force members and, and uh, can be made available to the public through the website. I think we were scheduled to take a break. Is that correct? So, so that was good practice. Sorry about that. Thank you. If we didn't make that clear to you all, we apologize. Um, let's take a 15 minute break. We'll reconvene at uh, two o'clock. That works out well. Thank you. We'll be in a short recess. Dim them or anything like that. I think everybody's ready to go. We'll reconvene the jail overcrowding task force. And we have a community supervision presentation. Uh, we have Indian Association of Community Corrections at Counties uh, representing uh, that organization, Ward Byers, and the Probation Officers Professional Association of Indiana, Adam McQueen. So, gentlemen, stage is yours. Thank you, Justice Davis. Thank you, Justice David, members of the task force. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ward Byers, Marshall County Community Corrections, and as you had mentioned, representing IACAC. Uh, community supervision. As, as you all know, uh, has a variety of different pieces to that. Everything from probation to community corrections. And within that community corrections element, you have electronic monitoring and home detention. But it also rolls into problem solving courts, uh, court administered drug and alcohol programs, diversion services, pretrial, uh, and uh, of course then the probation department. What we do in community, sur community supervision as, as a general rule, or we, are we are change agents. Our responsibility is to change behaviors of individuals that are in the criminal justice system. And while we do that, uh, we do that on an incremental basis. In other words, what I would like to say is that in a lot of cases, the individuals on our supervision programs are on for a short period of time, particularly in community corrections. So may you know, maybe the average sentence is 180 days. So what do, what do we do to, to look at those behaviors and do those incremental changes. So we utilize uh, risk assessments, screeners. So we look at the risk and the need, which um, Mr. McQueen is gonna talk about in a bit, but identify those and then place those individuals in the appropriate and meaningful therapeutic interventions that's going to help change those behaviors. Those being evidence-based practices. And those evidence-based practices are programs that have some scientific basis into them that have measured outcomes. They tell us that that individual has uh, changed that behavior or has completed that program successfully. And that's the whole role of the evidence-based uh, practice. Now, what you have to understand, is, again, is what I was talking about. Uh, in those two programs, we can't completely take an individual's 25, 30-year history of poor decision-making and fix that in a 180-day or a one-year or two-year period of time. But we can... but by lowering their risk upon exit from or completion of our programs, by taking that risk assessment again, that post risk assessment or that release risk assessment, we hope to see a reduction in their overall risk when we were turning them back out to uh, the community. Now I do wanna say that with the community supervision piece, um, what is important in my estimation and there was discussion about jail treatment programs and Sheriff Clark, I believe you have a, a good program in your county Jail treatment is a very important and key role, as is what happens in the Department of Correction, um, to begin that process. And in Marshall County, as an example, our jail treatment program is funded through uh, community corrections grants. And so that's how we are, are able to uh, roll out and fund and, and work the programs that we currently have. In community supervision, um, you know, you're talking about how do we reduce jail populations in Indiana. Um, community supervision, as you all know, it can and it does at times um, contribute to that population. And it does that in two significant ways, through uh, recidivism or new offenses, 
technical violations that come back into the county jail or go to the state prison. But it also can do that on a short-term impact. And what I want to say about the short-term impact is utilizing the county jail as an immediate sanction for those violations and then reintroducing that individual back into the county or the community um, after that sanction by utilizing graduated sanctions and incentives. And that is one way in which we reduce uh, the need for county jail utilization. And in most cases and in most counties, we have the practice of utilizing graduated sanctions and incentives. And in most cases, an individual has been through uh, administrative hearings. That individual has um, had a, a minimum of three technical violations and, and, and sanctions and incentives prior to them even going into the county jail or being taken to the county jail in most cases. The uh, recidivism um, that is indicated uh, and, and obtained from the Bureau of Justice st um, statistics will indicate that an individual um, to return to the Department of Corrections within three years of that offense date is considered recidivism. Uh, community corrections and probation um, can uh, lead to some of that recidivism through technical violations or new offenses committed by that offender. I want to say that um, in a lot of cases in, in the conversation of medication assisted treatment was discussed um, er, by earlier. I want to say that it's, in, it, it's vital uh, in order to help reduce that recidivism of individuals with substance use disorders that any time a county jail can utilize medication assisted treatment prior to that release it's vital or if there's a program in place to get that individual to a local treatment facility to begin medicated assisted treatment it's vital within that first 48 hours after release is generally the most critical time that that individual is going to go out and use. And so in order for them to have a successful outcome, they have to have a successful beginning. And that successful beginning in a lot of cases is utilization of medicated assistant treatment. An example in our community, uh, our jail uh, currently doesn't have a program for medicated, medication assisted treatment. We transport, we identify those individuals in the jail through screeners. Uh, through assessments of the Indiana Risk Assessment and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Screeners, and then discussing with that inmate if they're willing to participate in medication-assisted treatment. Community Corrections will then transport that person to our local treatment provider because arrangements have already been made and they begin that process so that they don't have that period of 48 hours without any assistance, and hopefully then they, do, um, they will not uh, use. Um, a person, in my estimation, cannot be successful coming out of state prison or county jail without some sort of in intervention that is currently there, whether that's an evidence-based therapeutic reentry center uh, or a good release or discharge plan uh, that comes out of the DOC. Uh, they, they provide a risk or they provide those progress reports, but I think also. Um, the case management systems were discussed, Sheriff Clark, and what is vital, uh, and, and you had indicated that providing information from those screeners to the Department of Correction is important, but that is also important to provide that information to your community supervision partners, because then what should be happening prior to that release is the development of those case plans or those release plans between the jail, between the, the treatment providers, the community supervision partners, so that that individual can be moves directly into a treatment environment without any significant delay. Adam? Thank you, Ward. Um, so we hear the, the term evidence-based practice a lot, uh, or EBP, and the fo different forms of community supervision that um, have been mentioned so far really focus their um, services on delivering evidence-based practices. Um, and through these uh, various EBPs, we determine who really to pri prioritize, um, what to target, um, but also, and lastly, maybe even most importantly, um, how to intervene or treat um, an individual. So all, those, all of those things are determined through that. Um, as is standard practice, corrections professionals are continually receiving 
ongoing training on what works. Uh, we have to keep ourselves up to date and effectively delivering those practices uh, can be very challenging. Um, they're an investment in time and effort. They're, uh, we're dealing with a population that can be extremely challenging. And then when you couple that with the fact that uh, caseloads in some situations are extremely high, uh, it can become difficult to deliver really meaningful outcome-driven uh, supervision. Um, as can be seen here from this chart, um, in general, probation um, caseloads across the state are on the rise. Now, you see here in the yellow, the yellow uh, misdeme are, represent misdemeanor probation supervisions received. Uh, we see that they're relatively stable from year to year. Um, where, where we're seeing the rise is in felony probation supervisions received. And since 2015, we're, we've experienced a 29% rise in felony probation supervisions received. So as you've seen that the, the snapshot that's on your screen today shows that uh, significant increase in community supervision numbers. Um, that, uh, that is uh, a, a direct uh, correlation to House Bill 1006 and those level six felons that come out um, and are serving their time in community supervision. So uh, one of the, one of the, in, uh, uh, one of the, like Adam had mentioned, one of the biggest problems of course is uh, the caseload ratio from case manager to um, client, that that growth is con continually outpacing um, our available resources. Uh, just in Marshall County alone, our community corrections caseload has tripled over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, we, we have anywhere from, our, our average caseload is around 125 individuals or clients that we supervise on any given time. Now, I know that's probably low compared to some larger counties, but uh, given the resources that Marshall County has, that's a significant number um, of individuals uh, that we uh, that we currently serve, both in probation and in community corrections. Adam, thank you. Your You're welcome. So this next slide is really just intended to demonstrate that caseloads vary across the state, but it's really not uncommon for caseloads to be in excess of 200 uh, clients per probation officer, um, which again, is, is very difficult to, to have a meaningful impact uh, when you're dealing with those, those kinds of numbers. Um, recently, actually, no, I'm sorry, in 2006, the American Probation and Parole Association actually completed a randomized experiment that compared the services received and outcomes achieved when probation officers had caseloads of 50 to 1 for moderate high-risk probation, probationers as compared to what's thought of as the typical caseload of 100 to 1. Uh, results confirm that probationers on 50 to 1 caseloads receive significantly more probation sessions, field visits, employer contacts, telephone con check-ins, substance abuse, and mental health treatment. Not a, not a huge surprise there. You have less people. You can devote more time to the individual, right? What, what the eye-opening part of this um, study was was that the consequence of receiving more, or as a consequence of receiving more services, they uh, also had significantly better probation outcomes, including fewer positive drug screens and other technical violations. In addition, the uh, Journal of Crime and Justice uh, released an additional study that, that um, showed that caseloads of 54 medium or moderate to high risk offenders reduced recidivism by roughly 30%. So we're talking about the long term impact here. So, as a, as a community supervision um, survey you see on your screen now, it talks about the average number of in sanctions versus incentives. It is imperative that community corrections programs, probation departments uh, utilize graduated sanctions and incentives to deal with those internal technical violations and not necessarily utilize the county jail in that first offense. There are instances where that does occur with a new crime. It does occur when an individual is found to be intoxicated and it found an individual is found to be a danger to themselves or others at that particular time. But that does not mean that that individual cannot then be brought back out, sanctioned, and continued on their community supervision sentence, um, and then incentivized for good behavior. Um, we have found in Marshall County that that is uh, a successful uh, process by utilizing the county jail for those immediate sanctions, but also 
the utilization of graduated sanctions and incentives through our violation uh, matrix, uh, we, have, um, we've have, we have seen great outcomes, and I think that you will see great outcomes throughout um, the state. The, uh, in a recent survey of community supervision agencies uh, conducted by Popeye and IACAC, 72% of the respondents indicated they have a formal process or program addressing those types of uh, graduated sanctions without any court intervention. So we're not taking those people back to the court, we're not filing motions to revoke, or we're not filing affidavits of probable cause to violate their terms, but we are dealing with those issues in-house. Uh, and we are seeing uh, good outcomes with that and uh, dealing with those uh, particular issues internally with, uh, with, the, um, um, with the graduated sanctions that we currently have in place. Yeah, go ahead, take, take the lead here. So really just to wrap it up here, um, we believe that every interaction, community supervision, um, believes that every interaction with an individual is an opportunity to make a meaningful impact, in other words, to reduce harm. Um, but a total cure isn't realistic. We're never gonna totally cure the problem. Fortunately, we know that uh, we can make incremental behavior change uh, when we have the necessary resources. Um, Caseloads are high and we need an injection of resources. We also acknowledge that there's a lot of work to be done to blanket the state with incentives and sanctions programs. There are gaps in that. Um, one of the steps that we, or recommendations that we thought that um, would be a good one for this particular group is um, to create or facilitate the creation of a problem solving court track specifically for technical violators. So we, we know the success of drug courts. Um, let's, let's copy that. To my knowledge, this doesn't exist. We don't have, uh, uh, um, at least in the state of Indiana, a problem solving court track for technical violators. Um, think of this as an intermediate step. A uh, person comes on supervision, they're enrolled in incentives and sanctions, and that person fails three, four, five times. The response now is for a petition for formal court intervention. Um, with problem solving courts specifically for technical violators, this adds a layer in between a failed incentives and sanctions and incarceration. Um, above and beyond that, I, I think. I feel strongly that the, the different community supervisions that we touched on at the very beginning, this is the answer. This, this is the answer to the overcrowding, we, we, to, to continue to rely on your community supervision resources um, and put your faith in those. Or did you have anything? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Adam. We, we uh, community supervision, Community corrections, uh, probation. Uh, we we are a, a partner in all of this with every other community justice partner. Um, we again have challenges, just like all of you. Uh, the length of time that we have with a client uh, sometimes is prohibitive of significant behavior change, but again, incremental change uh, can can and does occur. Uh, if we have been able to change a behavior slightly, uh, once that individual is finished with their sentence with us, that is considered a win. If an individual uh, has come to us and has not completed their GED, they don't have a job, they're having some uh, criminal thinking, but we've been able to uh, rectify those types of behaviors, we've been able to assist them with their employment, we've been able to put them into meaningful and appropriate treatment interventions. And we have been able uh, to aid them with getting that job or that GED and lower that risk score, or that IRAS score upon their completion. That's a success. Um, will they come back through the system? Probably, some people do. But those incremental changes and each time we have the ability to touch their lives, to supervise them, we address the necessary, um, the necessary risks and the needs, and we provide them the therapeutic and evidence-based services that they need based upon those risks uh, and, and mental health and substance abuse screeners. So uh, community corrections, community supervision works. Uh, if it's done properly, it, it works wonders, uh, and it is a great alternative to physical incarceration in your county jail sheriff or in your state prisons, Mr. Carter. 
Um, and so uh, we strive daily uh, in, our, in our jobs to be change agents, to help, the, to help those individuals who have had that 20, 30 years of antisocial criminal thinking to begin that process of change, which takes time. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's nothing that happens overnight. It's something that happens over time with proper and meaningful and appropriate interventions. I want to thank you all uh, for having us here today, and we'll take any questions the task force may have. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'm, I'm intrigued by your idea. I would invite you to uh, think some more about that and post those comments, those thoughts on the website by November 8th at 3 p.m. so we have the benefit of some additional uh, thought. And I would invite you or perhaps challenge you to think in terms of, of why, why would it even have to go to a uh, technical violation problem solving court? Why could there be some sort of, uh, of, of uh, other mechanism by which some of those could be resolved and, and sanctions are to be known to the uh, people on, 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 the, in, on probation or in community corrections so as to even keep them out of court. So we really appreciate. Uh, one question I have for both of you, um, since you have the pulse on your constituents out there, and this is a, a, a positive question, who's, uh, who do you want to give a shout out to that's out there doing cutting edge, dosage probation, turning things upside down, putting more resources on the higher risk and fewer resources on the low risk, uh, focusing on services and not so much on requirements that traditionally 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we'd give you 22 requirements, none of which caused you to come into the system, but we thought that was the right thing to do. Who, who's out there that we need to know of that, that's just doing tremendous work and is not getting the credit or the, or the attention they deserve? Anybody come to mind, any counties? Probably two for me, and there, and there are two that I uh, pay close attention to what's going on in their county. Uh, that's Monroe and Wabash counties. Um, to me, they, they take the step before everyone else, uh, or the steps before everyone else does. And I know that there are other examples of that, but they are. Who yeah, I a lot of people doing great work, but that's why I wanted to, so, so. Yes, Joseph. Those, those particular, from your perspective, would be I believe so. great go-bys. I believe so. Ward? So I would like to, uh, I would like to bring uh, forward uh, Grant County. I think Grant County has done great work. Uh, Mr. Cunningham uh, is their director. Uh, and uh, in addition, um, I, I think that um, there has been great work uh, also done um, in, in Wabash uh, County um, in, in here in Indiana. <coughs> I think those two counties are doing great work. All of them are doing wonderful things. Uh, there's good programs coming out every day and our associations through Popeye and IACAC are supporting them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I look at Grant County as a, as a real standout in, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our association uh, as, as a real leader uh, and very happy that, uh, that, that they do the work that they do. We're very pleased that, that you put Wabash County on that list. I know they, they it took them a while to get rid of that trial judge they had, so, or at least the, the one trial judge that they had that caused so much trouble. Yeah, change takes time, sir. Um, and, and we put you on the spot, or I put you on the spot, so please don't hesitate if, if other counties come to mind to supplement your testimony on the website. But that's very helpful, at least I, I believe it's helpful to us to, to, to know where there's additional go-bys and people that, that really need perhaps to, to have a greater audience for, for the work that they and the county and all the stakeholders in that county are doing. Members of the, of, of the task force, any other questions? Yes, Dave? I have a couple. Certainly. Uh, your slide, uh, gentlemen, that said, uh, listed the four categories of high risk and high need, high risk, moderate risk, low risk, uh, those four categories. Do you know how? Yeah, that one. No. You know how you're, you know, I know we have <coughs> some thousand people on felony and misdemeanor probation. Do you know how that total number breaks out? What percent of the total probationers are fit in each of those categories? That, that's a great question. Um, I know, I know that some, from some information that we have received, 
kind of things right now. Uh, the, the bulk of them are low risk. Um, and then the, the, that's what I'm, I'm assuming that, but I, I don't know for sure. The, the other thing is, is it fair to say that if folks are low risk, they probably shouldn't be supervised? Or is that what I hear at all the, of these high level meetings I go to? Evidence-based practice says there should be little to no touch with, with those but, low but risks. That the threat of, of uh, incarceration should be enough to deter them from committing future acts. I, I've even heard some experts say that if we supervise low risk folks, we increase their recidivism rates. Yes, sir. Yes, which sir. put them back in jail. Uh, and I know that's something everybody's working on fixing, but we don't know what that, we don't know that data point at this I, point. I don't, I'm sorry. The, 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 second, the second thing is I know that I've heard some talk about a new data system, SRS, is that right? Yes, sir. And is that gonna be a joint system that you both use, community corrections and probation? Is there gonna be a merger of data there? It, it is in some situations. Can, can you kind of explain to the group what that is yes, and how so it might help with this data information we have? Because I don't think folks realize probation especially didn't, it was kind of on their own. They didn't really sure. have a statewide system. Go ahead. We, we were at one point um, across the state using probably close to a dozen different case management systems, none of which communicated with one another, uh, caused siloing, pocketing of data. Um, I can speak from the probation side and, and, a l and touch a little bit from the community correction side, but I'll let Ward take that over. Uh, many of our folks are now moving from whatever they were previously on onto the supervisor release system, which is a suite um, um, within the inside application um, that really only in my opinion, I went from the company that I went to, and I won't mention the name of that company, but from the company that, I, that we went to for our case management to SRS, leaps and bounds ahead. Things that I had to, uh, data that I had to collect manually, put into spreadsheets, put, take hours to crunch, is done with a click of a button. Um, that's constantly improving. It's made my life a lot easier. Um, it is, n I, I think that the intent um, w would be that it would be a case-wide, or I'm sorry, ex excuse me, a statewide system um, there are some folks that have been given priority for various needs. Um, that's not something that can, um, that, uh, you know, someone can snap a finger and suddenly you're on SRS. It's, it's, a, it's a whole rollout process that takes a huge time investment from um, the, the folks at court, uh, Trial Court Technology. Um, and it, it, like I said, I, I think it's gonna be wonderful if, if and when one day we are all on one system that, and, and can all communicate in the same language, how much easier would that make life for us? So, Lord, any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Powell, um, our county, uh, like many, went to SRS. Uh, it has revolutionized, honestly, what we do in our data collection. But I think the biggest thing for the Department of Correction who collects our data uh, for our grant funding purposes, it has um, standardized that. And it has done a wonderful job of doing that. They can go in onto the backside and pull data from each of the counties. Um, whereas we were submitting data from multiple different um, platforms, depending on the county who had what and what the data looked like and, and that type of thing. So uh, SRS has done a wonderful job for us. It, in, it integrates with Odyssey, tells us about active court cases in other counties, warrants, but it also tells us um, about active or inactive community corrections cases in other counties as well, so that we have that one portal to go to and we can do all of our work out of that one spot instead of jumping from different um, different uh, websites within the state looking for different things. So it's been a great piece for us. Um, and uh, I know Sheriff Luce had talked about um, a standardized uh, system uh, for the state and, and I think that would be a wonderful thing as well. And if that could somehow tie into what we see as well, and then the sheriffs could see that in the same information, it would be a wonderful thing. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, whether that's an insight application, I don't know how that would work, but that would be really a neat thing if the state could figure out how to fund that. Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, excuse me, Sheriff. Uh, yeah, I just had one. Do you want to go ahead, Commissioner? Go ahead first. Oh, I missed two people. Go ahead, please. Hi. Thanks, guys. Basic question: Out of the um, the caseload, that's that's a pretty big caseload. I wasn't aware of that, so I appreciate you sharing that. Sure. Out of your caseload, what percentage 
under your supervision is that that would otherwise be released to parole from prison that are going to probation. So about 40% from, from our figures go to probation. Of individuals being released from the Department of Corrections? Right, yeah, how, how much of that is, is your caseload? Uh, I mean, you can do an average, I don't know. You know. I, I don't know that I could come up with it. I think is it it's big gonna vary. Is it, is it small, is it a small number, or is it significant? It would be hard for me to speak to any to any anyone else other than my own county. Um, in in Wayne County, where, where I'm assistant chief probation officer, um, the vast majority come from our local jails. If they're they're either um, uh, totally suspended sentences or partially uh, suspended sentences that come from our jails. And the reason that I know that is because uh, my prosecutor just recently shared with me that. Um, Level six and, and uh, felons and below account for 84 percent of our of all of our charges um, in Wayne County. So there's not really any other, any other place for them to go other than the local county jail. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Just real quickly, I also thought the problem-solving track idea was interesting. Would like to see does that offer alternatives to incarceration besides just probation and jail? Because I'm sure a lot of the sheriffs would share my frustration and a large percentage of my population are probation violators, parole violators, work release violators, or in other words, failures of things that we've tried to put on them to help them get through the system. If we could figure out some alternatives besides just probation, jail, like an in-between, step-down kind of a thing, that would be a really big benefit, at least for me personally, and I'm sure for a, a lot of the other sheriffs. It, in the so state. as an example, in our county, we started um, a few years ago utilizing community corrections as a graduated sanction without a court intervention then probation department notifies the court of the violation, but in their terms, they have agreed that a, a sanction can be to community corrections. So instead of taking them straight to the jail, they'll be referred to community corrections based upon the agreed upon terms uh, by our local judiciary uh, that was approved. And then we, through, through case planning with probation, will then GPS alcohol monitoring, our 800 drug line, um, we have a reporting app uh, called, called Court Facts that we utilize a lot for our low risk people so we have more hands off with them, um, which is working very well. Mr. Powell, as you had mentioned about the low risk individuals and less is more uh, with them. But we have, we have started that in our county. Um, so trying to alleviate the need to place individuals in our county jail on certain probation violations utilizing community corrections as that intermediate sanction and then stepping them back down to probation is the ultimate goal so that they can finish out their sentence with them without placing them in the county jail. Thanks. Yes, sir. One of the things we found out on 1006, the different parties within the criminal justice system did not communicate well. Correct. Well, nobody's fault. Yep. But now we're understanding the significance of data collection and the importance to us all. Yes. Um, now's the time to talk to the Sheriff's Association about their RFQ. Okay. For what they're doing. I think it would be fantastic if you guys coordinate your efforts so everybody can share information. I would agree. Yeah. So. And well, as, as I mentioned to Sheriff Clark earlier, those discharge and release plans of individuals okay. coming out of your jails, uh, of, our, of our county jails, to community supervision. So we know what programs they've been in. We know what issues you've had with them. And those, those discharge or case plans uh, can be vital. It's just like when you leave the emergency room, you get, right. you get a case plan or a discharge yes. summary. No different than when you come out of the jail. Uh, DOC does it with their progress reports for folks coming out on community transition, and that's how we gauge acceptance or denial, that type of thing. So I think that's a statewide effort that can work, and that's something we are in Marshall County working towards um, having just received uh, the um, Justice Partners Addictions Grant uh, through Office of Court Services, we will be working to develop those plans with our jail, placing individuals in the jail to do criminal rule 26 work, and uh, as well as uh, recovery coaches and walking those inmates through the process to that ultimate discharge or release plan uh, to community supervision or to the DOC. Well, the Sheriff's Association is right behind you. We'll coordinate from the General Assembly with DOC and you Certainly, sure. IACAC would be right. more than happy to work with ISA on any of those issues. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. You. Thank you.
We will now uh, take uh, public testimony, uh, three minutes. Uh, please be mindful of your time. Uh, Judge David Hoppe, representing the Madison County Unified Courts. Your Honor. Good afternoon, Justice David, members of the task force. Appreciate you being here in Madison County to listen to our experience locally. I'm here on behalf of our Unified Court judges to talk to you about what's been happening in Madison County for the last few years in jail crowding. Jail crowding has been a problem here for several decades. It's not a new problem here, but there are a couple of factors that changed in recent years which have taken it from a challenge to more of a crisis situation. One of those is the, the drug situation involving the opioid epidemic and the more recent uptick in methamphetamine cases. Our county is one of those where the health department has declared an emergency due to the transmission rates of uh, hepatitis. And there's been a lot said about the drug situation. I won't belabor that and go over that again, but I want to talk about one other factor which is maybe more particular to our county. And that is one consequence of the 1006 legislation that has caused us um, some um, aggravation of our jail crowding problems. I'm not here to criticize 1006. It was welcome, much needed reform, but as with any complex set of litigation or of uh, legislation, there are some unintended consequences that creep in. Um, specifically, the factors that have affected Madison County are the redefinition of crimes to increase the number of available level sixes. That's led to an uptick, annualized at about 7% increase since 1006 was put in place here. And that uptick in level six cases happened at the same time that placement restrictions were put in place so that a lot of the level six folks weren't eligible to be placed in the DOC. And I understand the policy reasons for that. But it's left us with a situation where with a pre-existing jail crowding problem, we have nowhere to put those people. The reality on the ground is for us judges who are doing the sentencing here, we're often in a situation where we have someone who's not appropriate for probation, they need some form of executed sentence, we don't have room for them at the jail and they're not able to be placed in the DOC. So they end up on some form of community corrections like in-home detention or work release. Unfortunately, because of those folks are not people we traditionally would have expected to perform well in a community correction setting, a lot of them don't perform well. They do walk away from home detention, they walk away from work release. and. When that happens, they end up charged with failure to return. So our failure to return charging rate increased 354% after 1006 took effect. So it was a dramatic increase. And I think it's more of a, a situation that's happened in our county than in some other counties because of some localized factors. But there has been a really dramatic increase in level sixes overall, particularly in the failure to returns. So those are some of the particular pressures being put on our system here locally. There is some good news locally and what we would need to respond to it, and I want to make you aware of that as we look at situations around the state too. We have a really excellent local cooperation. We've got a jail crowding task force which has been operating for the last uh, two to three years, and everyone involved in the system has been participating very well with that. Our sheriff and our prosecutor in particular have been very active participants in that program, in that uh, meeting, and all the other parts of the system have been represented as well. We've also gotten outstanding technical support and training from the Supreme Court that's enabled us to put into place some programming which has some impact on jail crowding. Three specific programs I'd like to mention to you are, first of all, Problem Solving Court. You're all pretty familiar with that. We have a very large and active Problem Solving Court in this county, which helps us defer a lot of people who would otherwise be on an incarceration track to get community services. We also, uh, because of our local opioid numbers, created a local uh, program for people to be safely managed in the community with opioid blocking therapy, specifically Vivitrol injections, and that's been successful both at the pretrial stage and for people after sentencing. Finally, we're uh, coming up on the tail end of a process of completely revamping our bail system here in the county. As of January 1st, we'll be rolling out a new system whereby most nonviolent, low-level offenders will be automatically released from incarceration without having to post any cash bond. They'll then be assessed and given appropriate community services based on their, uh, their assessment and needs. So we've tried a variety of solutions, including those and some other things, which have helped, but we haven't yet found the magic combination which has cured this problem for us. It's been with us for decades, and we expect it's not going to go away immediately anytime soon either. The one particular lesson that we really picked up from the last year <coughs> of collaborating between agencies locally is that when people are at the meetings, their agency works better. Putting the spotlight on it, putting the attention on it, it, it focuses attention and it makes everyone perform better and helps the local numbers improve, at least for a while. So that's the situation in Madison County in, I think, less than three minutes. Um, I appreciate the comprehensive look that the task force is taking at this issue, with, with this issue. I thank you all for being here, and we really are sincerely looking forward to seeing your recommendations and your findings. Thank you. Thank you, Judge, and thank you to your uh, task force uh, that you are participating in and everyone that's been involved in that. And uh, again, we're asking presenters uh, to provide any supplemental uh, items they wish to our website. And, 
and you might just want to copy all the minutes of that meeting, those meetings, and send them to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vandenberg County Sheriff uh, David Wedding, please. You're up next, sir. <coughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me speak today. I want to read a quick letter from one of my Superior Court judges. It's Judge Wayne Trockman. And he wrote a letter to me this morning and said, the Vanderbilt Superior and Circuit Courts are proud to be working in close partnership with you and your office in an attempt to control jail population. Together, we have implemented several new programs to help reduce jail population, as well as utilizing other ways in which level six felonies can have an alternative to jail incarceration. We have revised all aspects of our work release program, which have nearly ceased to operate when you, Judge Kiley, and myself formed our work release partnership. At that time, the 200 bed facility had approximately 40 <laughs> residents. We've now formed therapeutic work release and is now operating at capacity and providing treatment and other programming to all participants, mainly level six felons who would otherwise be incarcerated in our jail. These nearly 200 participants are working and supporting their families, contributing to the community, and are receiving professional treatment for their drug and alcohol abuse addiction. We have implemented an electronic home detention program for eligible residents of Vanderbilt County, and thanks to Commissioner Carter and DOC, we got a $93,000 grant to pay from EHD services. There are many forces out of our control that are affecting jail population. Many plea agreements are reducing level four and five felonies to level six felonies. These pleas usually result in an executed level six time in the Vanderbilt County Jail. The number of shootings in Vanderbilt County have increased significantly this year. In, in October alone, uh, 15 people were victims of gun violence. Finally, the revisions to the criminal code have made many previously more serious drug offenses now level six felonies, which usually result in IDLC time being served at the Vanderbilt County Jail. Thank you for working with the courts to attempt to control this perpetual problem of jail overcrowding in Vanderbilt County. I also have spoken to several psychologists and treatment people in Evansville, and they said one of our problems is we have lack of safe housing for people to go back to these drug addicts. So they go back to the original area where the drug addictions occur and they get back into trouble. They said they also have trouble finding jobs and work. Once you get that felony drug charge or charge on your record, people don't want to hire you. So it's a perpetual problem. A lot of unaddressed mental illness. Many addicts have underlying mental illness and they also have an adverse childhood experience or ACE. Uh, and this is abuse, neglect, household challenges through the first 18 years of their life, which finds their way into drugs, uh, alcohol, and certainly criminal activity. Uh, and I'll close up, but uh, I, I hope we can get the reimbursement for us housing prisoners up adequately to support our mission of uh, keeping our community safe because the money we have now is inadequate to support the sheriff's offices. I really agree with uh, the talk today about the parole and probation problem we face because oftentimes people come back in for violations of either parole or probation. And I think if we work on that, we can minimize uh, incarceration. Jails weren't really built for real rehabilitation purposes, but now uh, we are short-term housing and long-term as a rehabilitative measure. So th there's lots to talk about, and I have very limited time. Uh, lastly, the majority of property crimes and non Violent crimes are pled to lesser offenses, so the courts and prosecutor are doing a reasonable job minimizing the impact towards the perp perpetrators of crime. This may lead criminals to reoffend due to the consequence not being tough enough. So I'm willing to work with everyone. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 39 years. I met with uh, Representative Sturwalt several years ago supporting House Bill 1006. But I think sheriffs really need to get together and figure it out because to take on, for us, 162 level six felons, we need some support and we're not getting it presently. Thanks, Sheriff. Thank you very much. That concludes the public testimony today.
Justice Goff has been asked to give some remarks and closing remarks from Senator J.D. Ford. Justice Goff. Uh, thank you, Justice David. Over the past several weeks, the people sitting at the front of this room have traveled the state and listened to public comment on issues relating to jail overcrowding in Indiana. They have also listened to the concerns and suggestions of various stakeholders in Indiana's criminal justice system. Those stakeholders include the Association of Indiana Counties, the Indiana Sheriff's Association, the Indiana Office of Judicial Administration, providers of jail medical services, successful local multidisciplinary teams, experts and pioneers in Indiana's bail reform initiative, professionals and leaders from the treatment community, the Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council, the Indiana Public Defenders Council, community supervision professionals, legislators leading criminal justice reform efforts, and more. During our time together, it has been observed by more than one person and on more than one occasion that this problem is a complicated one. I agree with that observation, but as we close our time together, I recall all that we have heard over the past several weeks and say with some degree of confidence that Indiana stands better prepared today than at any time in its history to confront this problem. There has always been a tension in the criminal justice system between the need to protect individual rights and the need to protect public safety. Although I am an optimist, I do not think that that tension will ever disappear. But the truth is, most of the time, treating people with dignity and respect is the best thing you can do to make your community a safer place. And with that truth in mind, I say this. If you are a treatment provider, if you serve in local government, if you serve in corrections, if you are a victim, if you are a public defender, if you are a corrections professional, if you are in law enforcement, if you are a judicial officer, or if you are simply a concerned Hoosier, know that your interests are important. Know that this body will endeavor to understand them and to the extent possible, serve them for the betterment of all Hoosiers. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, please educate yourself on the work of this body. Please take the time to read the materials on the website and please understand them for all that they are. Because while it is true that this body will consider them in its deliberations and recommendations for policy reform, you can make use of them as well. No community is exactly the same. We have different challenges, different available resources, and different ideas on how best to solve certain problems. You can and should be a part of the solution. People in your community need your best efforts to succeed and to stay safe, and they need your best efforts now. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Goff. Senator Ford. Thank you, Justice David, and uh, I'll just uh, ditto uh, Justice Goff, um, but I just wanted to kind of do some uh, recap of myself. Uh, first, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, to this committee for the work that we're doing. Uh, it's been an honor to serve with you all, and I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, thank you for the presenters uh, that have presented uh, throughout this time, and certainly thank you to the public for giving us your, your feedback. Um, I've taken this assignment very serious. Um, I have uh, met with all three sheriffs of the counties that I represent uh, toward the Marion County Jail. I've listened to jail, jail command staff uh, as well as uh, talked to inmates along the way. And uh, one of the things that keeps uh, ringing in my mind is that uh, as inmates were sharing with me, uh, they mentioned that uh, they've tried to get help along the way, uh, but was turned away or refused. And so I think we've got to do a better job in that. I've also heard inmates, uh, inmates say to me, or offenders say to me, that uh, no one has believed in them uh, throughout their time. Um, and I think that uh, that's something that we should all uh, take heed. Um, the Marion County statistic that was shared uh, this afternoon is very frightening to me. Um, and I definitely like the discharge plan uh, that, we, uh, that we've uh, shared today. Uh, some of the things that we talked about today, more treatment in jails, uh, lack of funding, uh, no standards with the screening for individuals, access upon release, uh, I think that's all stuff that should definitely be on the table. Um, also, uh, expanding recovery works, maximizing the MAT, care coordination, and then the uh, changing it from 30 days to 90 days, uh, I think should also uh, be on the table. The one thing I've heard throughout this entire time uh, is that we need to do a better job of collecting data. Um, and so I think that uh, that's definitely something that we should consider 
as we make our final recommendations. But we're all here to address this issue. We're taking it very serious. I'm happy to report that. Um, I just hope that as we make those final recommendations um, that we uh, understand that we move away from warehousing folks um, and getting the, the desperate treatment that these folks uh, need. Uh, in other words, looking at the factors at the front end instead of us frantically trying to fix this, uh, this issue or this problem at the back end. Um, a couple of the issues that I see uh, improving mental health access, both inside the jail and also outside the jail, uh, enhancing the opioid addiction services, and certainly providing a livable wage uh, for folks uh, so we can lift those Hoosiers out of poverty. Uh, these are some of the issues that I see, and I stand ready to help. And again, I just want to say thank you to uh, all the members involved, and I appreciate uh, all the work that we've done so far. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ford. It was two or three years ago I was working with uh, a group of, of people in a, in a county, and, and they were struggling to try to improve some processes. And I ran across a quote from Mother Teresa uh, that said, I can, I can do things you cannot do and you can do things that I cannot do. Together we can do great things, trying to bring this group closer together. And, and I can just see sort of a variation of that in the minds of our legisl legislators that uh, put this together with, with uh, uh, significant feedback and support from the governor's office and, and, and take great pride in the fact that I think the judicial branch was very supportive, uh, bringing people with different perspectives together uh, stealing from Mother Teresa that we can do things you can't do and you can do things we can't do, but together we can do great things. And that is, I think, what we've been trying to do and what we intend to do. Um, thank you for your attention today. Public comments can be submitted uh, up until 3 p.m. on November 8th, so uh, if you want to work at night or work during the day, we certainly will be the beneficiaries of, of your comments. We will have another meeting on November 25th at 1 p.m. in Indianapolis. That will be an executive session, and, and a portion of that may be open to the public, and we'll make that announcement very quickly. Again, thank you for your attentiveness, your respect for the process. Uh, again, please don't uh, neglect to post any additional comments, and I'd just like to publicly thank the members of the Jail Overcrowding Task Force. It's been a great honor to serve and to continue to serve with you in this endeavor. So we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.